He's the new true blue superhero with a mission to revive the fortunes of the Conservative Party. You've got to keep making the political weather. The media is starting to pick up on, on what we're saying. The debate is being set by us. David Cameron aims to lead back to power a Tory party demoralised by three successive election defeats. Being leader of the opposition is one of the most difficult jobs in government. Unless you destroy the stereotype, you have no chance of winning. So Cameron has adopted an unlikely image for a Tory leader and taken up new causes he hopes will chime with young voters. Does this break with the past achieve what he wants? People go on about him being sort of Tony Blair's natural successor. I, I think he's more mine and he's, he's basically the press guy. Party leaders have habitually tried to modernise their parties to gain power, to stop being opposition leader and become leader of the country. So what can David Cameron learn from their successes and from their failures? People have to decide whether he's Chantel, David Beckham or whether he's actually a great person. some very searching questions about the team. The political marketing men have an exciting new product. I mean, listen, you look the at these, you look at this, this yeah. mass of photos here, and you know, there's, you know, politicians are always smiling, but it's, this is a, this is a man a, who cares. It's a happy bunch. Yeah, it's, it's a man who's he's got a fake, he cares about his family, he cares about the environment, he cares yeah. about the big the issues of the day. He's, this is yeah. not a nasty conservative. He's yet to prove he can take on the Tory, you know, the Tory sort yeah, of... the Tory yeah, ghost. Yeah, the toughness yeah. of it. He's got to do something to stand up against the past. He's got to stand yeah. for something. I think the most important thing to bear in mind is that when David inherited the party, along with lots of other Tory leaders in, in recent past, he had a brand that was contaminated. The leaders who came before David Cameron were, first of all, confused about whether to be modernisers or traditionists. Let's be honest, it takes a huge amount for your core supporters to reject you. David Cameron is the first person to try modernising and to stick at it, and I think he will stick at it. But he has the great advantage, there's no kind way of putting this, he has charisma and the others did not. And that is a, a, a vitally missing ingredient that was of course um, a huge disadvantage for the previous three. That's his, it's that is his brand. He goes beyond Mr Nice Guy and is actually also quite capable of being Mr Hard, yeah. uh, tough nut. Yeah. I think that nearly 10 years out of office and a long period when they were utterly discredited while they were still in office has left a scar. He's, he has moved the image of the Conservatives on from being unpleasant to being, to being palatable. Yeah. They've learned the hard way that they've got to change and that we're in a different era. We're in the 21st century now. Yeah, I think there needs to be a team and there needs to be a party that thinks in accord with him. Which one would you most like to see lead the Conservative Party into the next general election? American pollster Frank Luntz was invited by Newsnight to run a so-called dial test, measuring people's responses to a Cameron speech during the leadership contest. And I want us to be a consistent... Luntz now advises Cameron. When we did the, the dial stuff for Newsnight, he blew people away. There are times in this quite new politics we have, when Tony Blair sits in the middle of the British political spectrum, when he says or even does conservative things. That is the best segment I have ever tested in politics. All three groups, including those that don't vote conservative, dialed it at 90 or higher. You dialed it as high as you could go. The key was how he spoke. The key was his messaging. His voice would go up. There, there, there would be a sense of intensity to him. And you didn't see that in the other candidates. And how would our audience vote in a general election? Who would vote for David Cameron? Incredible. They voted for David Davis, 64,398. They voted for David Cameron, 134,446. So Britain had a new opposition leader. For many, a breath of fresh air. I said when I launched my campaign that we needed to change in order to win. Now that I've won, we will change. At last, a Tory had emerged who could do something quite well. Um, 
he could stand on a platform and speak a carefully rehearsed speech without notes. That They loved it. Um, and he captured the mood. And it's proper. That's how leadership works. You capture the emotions of people, and he did that. Uh, and suddenly they, they snapped out of their slumber, and they started thinking it. They started believing that they could win again. I'm fed up with the punch and judy politics of Westminster. I think today policy matters hardly at all. Um, why? Because people don't believe politicians. If you say, I'm going to cut taxes, they don't believe you. What they think is, aha, that's code for, I'm going to cut public spending, I'm going to cut public services. No more grumbling about modern Britain. I love this country as it is, not as it was, and I believe our best days lie ahead. What people want to know is, what kind of a guy is this leader? Is he there basically to do a good job or a bad job? Is he there to help other people or not? In the end, it's about what you decide you are going to do as a party of government. And the public aren't stupid. The public get there. They get the point about people. So at the moment, I mean, Cameron is having the most incredibly long media honeymoon, I think, of any political leader ever. And he will find very, very quickly that unless you've done the really difficult policy decisions, you unravel. And I, I can't see Cameron really sustaining it through an election campaign because he doesn't strike me as having the depth. David Cameron may well be making political waves. The strategy is grabbing the headlines and the Tories think they're on the up again. But getting your political grip is about more than just a slogan or two. Perhaps now the Tories will start to learn the lessons of the past, starting with 1945, when their party was left reeling after the country deserted them. Churchill was certain the voters he had led to victory would keep him in number 10. I can feel it in my bones we're going to win. But his bones deceived him. A Labour landslide condemned Britain's greatest war leader to the ignominy of being opposition leader. It's always said to have been a Yugoslav lady who, when Churchill was defeated in 1945, uh, said, oh, poor Mr Churchill, they'll now take him out and he'll be shot. But on hearing the story, Churchill said, no, no, no. They've actually reserved a far worse fate for me. I'm going to have to be leader of the opposition. And leader of the opposition is a dreadful job, frankly. Uh, and it's an even worse job if you've been prime minister. And very few prime ministers acclimatise to being leader of the opposition. The result sent Churchill into one of his deep depressions. The only thing um, that appeared to cheer him up at that time was when people put on a gramophone record of a, a very popular, cheerful wartime ditty, Run, Rabbit, Run. left his colleagues running the country, choosing instead to while away his time drinking vintage champagne here at the Savoy. In victory, I deserve it, he said. In defeat, I need it. The Tories almost believed they had a God-given right to rule. They were out of sorts and out of office. As one Tory woman said at the time, they've elected a Labour government and the country will never stand for it. He really ran the opposition very badly. He used to have these lunch parties. They drank a great deal. No one quite clear at the end what had happened. He was always saying to his colleagues on the front bench, hold yourself in readiness. I may speak or I may not. Uh, so you better be prepared. And they all got fed up with it because um, sometimes the old man would, would appear and they'd have prepared a great speech and they wouldn't have the chance of delivering it. Clement Attlee's government set about creating the welfare state. In the Tory opposition, it was Shadow Chancellor Rab Butler who understood how different the post-war world would be. The Tories realised there was a new world and they adapted quickly. Now during the Second World War, the Tories had already been working within the coalition with Labour on policies that were semi-socialist, like the creation of the National Health Service. That was a joint Labour-Conservative project. So actually they were pretty well suited, they were pretty well prepared for accepting a much more socialised, socialist world post-1945, and to the credit of the Tory party, they took that on board pretty quickly, and they kind of beat Labour at their own game. In 1951, to be precise, when the Tories found themselves back in power, and Winston back in number 10. Labour would remain out of power for the next 13 years. Your lecture tour 
Tell us something of how you view the election prospects. How are you going to a good fight? A good, a good chance of winning. And it was Shadow Chancellor Hugh Gateskill who became Labour leader when Attlee lost the election in 1955. Hugh Gateskill was very much a new Labour man. He was really Mr Blair before his time. He was to the right of the Labour Party and there's a view today that if he hadn't died so young, Labour would not have had the chequered history they've had. Rab Butler's and Hugh Gateskill's policies were then thought to be indistinguishable, and the term Butskillism was coined. Butskillism, from which I think both Hugh Gateskill and Rab Butler suffered pretty horribly, was a term invented by the economist. And there was something in it, because there wasn't a great divide in those days between Gateskill as Shadow Chancellor and Rab as Chancellor. But Gateskill's struggles with his divided party were reflected in the results of the 1959 election. In Leeds, Mr Hugh Gateskill, the leader of the opposition, though re-elected, was still to be in opposition. He lost by a hundred seats to Macmillan. Macmillan fighting on the sort of washing machine and the refrigerator and the smart car and the garage. A real consumer, uh, durable selection that. But then after 59, he decided, you know, I've got to do something to modernise the Labour Party. We can't go on like this. We can't go on being the party of the co-op against Marx and Spencer. It won't do. Symbolic of Gateskill's problem was Clause 4, Labour's pledge to nationalise industry. He made a speech about three or four months after the election and called for the removal of Clause 4. Nationalisation on balance lost us votes. Well, I said the majority view, and I'm not surprised that there should be a minority that disagrees. Gateskill's mission unfulfilled, he died in 1963. Would his successor do what he never did and become Prime Minister? Who would his successor be? It was that cunning political operator, Harold Wilson. Mr. Wilson was one of the most Machiavellian politicians ever at Westminster, but he had a very tricky job because the Labour Party then, indeed at most times in its entire history, there's been a lot of infighting, and he had to sort all that out, but he was, I think, the right leader uh, for the Labour Party at that time. My friend, we do not support savage... Wilson, like all Labour leaders before and since, had to deal with his dissidents. But he appealed over their heads to the electorate outside with a vision of a modern party that would modernise Britain once elected. The Britain that is going to be forged in the white heat of this revolution will be no place for restrictive practices or for outdated methods on either side of industry. We used to hear an endless amount about aluminium smelting. God save us, aluminium smelting in South Wales. Endless speeches I've heard Wilson make about that. Not even thought to have a sexy subject, but he somehow made it exciting because he said, we are the modern party, we stand for the white heat of the technological revolution. The Tories are just a crowd of old funny duddies. Harold Wilson was a great communicator and had used all these techniques like the pipe and so on to communicate a sort of affable, friendly chap. No one was cleverer, I think, at planting stories. No one was cleverer at knowing when he should appear on television, when he shouldn't appear on television. And he was a, uh, he was a very consummate artist in terms of modern politics. By contrast, the then Tory Prime Minister, Sir Alec Douglas Hume, looked out of touch. There's a famous exchange he had with a television makeup lady. And he's sitting there in the makeup room in front of the mirror, and he says, I hope you'll be able to do something to uh, make me uh, look better. I usually look ghastly on television. She said, Afraid nothing can be done. He said, What do you mean nothing can be done? She said, Well, I'm terribly sorry, there's nothing I can do. You've got a head like a skull. <laughs> I can't disguise that. It may have been his patrician looks or public fatigue with Tory scandals, but Hume was defeated in 1964. Harold Wilson exchanged the worst job in politics for the best job. The Tories decided to select their own version of Wilson, grammar school boy Edward Heath. 
Unfortunately for Heath, he didn't have Wilson's media and presentational skills. Ted was never the sort of people's hero. I think there was a certain respect for him, uh, but you know, those awful heaving shoulders and that laugh. <laughs> it wasn't sort of prime glamour material for a politician. I said, well, it's quite easy to do an impersonation of Edward Heath. Anybody can do it. You can try this at home, actually, for yourself. All you've got to do is imagine you're wearing a badly fitting jacket like that. <laughs> then imagine somebody's dropped itching powder down your back. <laughs> and start laughing. <laughs> I think Hippolyte Heath was wholly unsuited to be a modern party leader. He was a very awkward figure, very lacking in charisma. He was considered to be a very unintelligent figure. He'd go into a pub and really look badly out of place. I'm a home-loving man. Yeah, yeah. You better go home now, I think. I'm going home now, the biggest issue with Heath was that he was a single man and therefore lonely and isolated and he communicated in that way. Um, he, he was slightly pompous, slightly patronising. He didn't reach out to people, he talked at them. How low does your personal rating among your own supporters have to go before you consider yourself a liability to the party you lead? Well, popularity isn't everything. And Ted Heath didn't enjoy much of it. His occasional awkwardness was famously seized upon by Harold Wilson, who accused him of being a shiver, looking for a spine to run up. But events were moving in the Tory party's favour. Wilson's reputation was damaged by the devaluation of the pound. From now on, the pound abroad is worth 14% or so less in terms of other currencies. That doesn't mean, of course, that the pound here in Britain, in your pocket or purse or in your bank, has been devalued. I think people just thought, you know, this is a con man. And so one of the assets that Ted had going for him was that Wilson was a busted flush. Even so, few predicted that Heath would beat Wilson in the general election. I well remember the shock of his victory in 1970. I remember reading Heath's political obituary in the week of the election, saying, you know, this man is about to lose the election and he'll pass into history as a great failure. The following Friday morning, he was Prime Minister. It was an extraordinary victory. He was the only person who was convinced he was going to win. It's not, I think, a closely guarded secret that on the Sunday before polling day, a deputation went to see him with sort of quite senior Conservatives, sort of make the arrangements for what should happen after the defeat when he would be announcing his departure and this kind of thing. So that wasn't pretty much of a vote of confidence the poor man to have, but his own faith remained absolutely buoyant throughout. He thought he was going to win, he was right, he did. Heath couldn't deliver. His ambitious manifesto couldn't be fulfilled and he never got a second term. When Margaret Thatcher told him she would challenge for the leadership, he simply said, if you must. Her brand of Tory politics would break the post-war consensus that prevailed for 30 years and revolutionise the country. Britain's first female opposition leader knew exactly where she intended to go. From the moment she became leader of the opposition, she showed qualities that no one had detected in her before. She took to life as opposition leader with an amazing sort of ease and naturalness and became almost a superstar overnight. Margaret Thatcher played to her strengths. A striking woman, attractive to many men, she slowly overcame residual prejudice in her front bench colleagues. There were lots of people who were pretty snobbish about her. There was a kind of feeling that she wasn't uh, top draw, that she was an anomaly that probably She'd only be there for a short period, win the election or not win the election. Probably this was going to be a short-term phenomenon. Well, how wrong we were. Britain is not a place merely for big, large companies. She had a very clever whiz kid kind of advisor, a man called Gordon Rees, who was a television producer. And he did a marvellous job for her. He lowered the voice an octave, as he said. I don't believe it was a whole octave myself, but certainly the voice did become less high pitched. And on the same issues, you know, the tax, prices, law and order. 
he taught her to understand how image worked. So she thought about it. Uh, and so she would think about the jewelry she was wearing, she would think about the clothes she was wearing, she would think about the environment she was in, the people that were with her and so on. Margaret Thatcher came to dominate the media that had so unkindly depicted her predecessors. She was at home in a studio, well trained for the demands made of a modern politician. Let me introduce uh, straight away the leader of the opposition. A uh, piece of music we've got. Two brothers fighting on opposite sides, and one sees the other. I hadn't heard Did that. Did you think I'd leave you dying when there's room on my horse for two? Two little boys had two little toys. Each had a wooden horse. Again. And down, down, and up, and round about. In the 1979 election campaign, though, she uh, held the calf in her arms, much to the horror of her husband, Dennis, who was there. So put that bloody thing down, it'll be some terrible accident. <laughs> she did create an image that was maybe not everybody's cup of tea, but which was an absolute brand, wasn't it? I mean, if you think back now of Mrs. Thatcher, you think of the hairstyle, you think of the blue suit, you think of the penetrating eyes. It was a brand. Margaret Thatcher just had, I think, the strongest brand of any politician that I can recall. She was very much aware that she was a leader on probation. She recognised that if she lost the 79 election, that would be it. She wasn't going to have two bites of the cherry. She knew, because of the unorthodoxy of uh, having a woman leader, that if the woman leader couldn't bring it off in one go, she'd be out. To enhance her credibility as a potential Prime Minister, Mrs Thatcher made the pilgrimage to Washington to meet seriously powerful people and make her mark. She didn't do what politicians are supposed to do, um, which is to speak about the glories of Britain. She attacked the British government, which you're not supposed to do. And when she was told off about this, she said, it's not part of my job to sing the praises of a socialist Britain. The present Labour government has changed the law in such a way that a person who's worked satisfactorily and well for a company or undertaking for years can now be sacked not because he's not a good worker, but because he refuses to join a union. And then, of course, the Russians started to take notice. Red Star, the Red Army paper, um, coined the phrase, the Iron Lady, and she loved it. It was meant to be an insult, and of course she lived with that name for the rest of her, her political life. The Russians said that I was an Iron Lady. Uh, they were right. <laughs> Britain needs an Iron Lady. I was inspired to join the party by Margaret Thatcher. She appeared to be so dynamic. Uh, in those days, the Labour Party looked pretty clapped out. You know, it was an older generation of people. They'd been around for a long time. They were completely in hock to the trade unions. It had a kind of feel of decay, if not actually corruption. And she came along and she was absolutely bursting with life. I mean, it was in her personality. I remember young people thinking, this is the coming thing. This is the new age. This is where the future is. This is where the dynamism is. In 1979, Prime Minister Jim Callaghan had been humiliated by the strikes in the winter of discontent. This was the Tories' opportunity. The rubbish piled high in the streets. Ambulances left unmanned. The dead unburied. She won the election because Britain was a tip. Um, inflation was, whatever it was, 14%. In interest rates were 16%. Unemployment was 3.5 million. And um, we'd just gone to the IMF for a huge loan, so we were bankrupt. The truth about the 79 election is not that they embraced Margaret Thatcher. It's what we think about today, 30 years later. The public did not embrace Margaret Thatcher. They rejected the Labour Party. Labour had been there too long. All the conditions were there for a Conservative victory, but she still believed that if she frightened the electorate with policies that were too radical, even at a time when people might be inclined to think that radical solutions were called for, that in the end they would balk at it and they wouldn't elect her. So she was Margaret Cautious Cautious Thatcher. 
The Saatchi Brothers advertising agency was hired by Central Office for the campaign. The young Tim Bell was among those behind one of history's best remembered election posters. The one with the winding queue. It was quite revolutionary to suggest that we ran a poster all over the country that instead of having conservative in the headline had the word Labour in the headline. So we had a conversation about that. Um, and quite a lot of her colleagues were extremely anti it and thought it was um, too clever by half and so on. Uh, but we won the day, ran the poster. It, of course, caused the most extraordinary controversy. Dennis Healy attacked it on television. It got shown on all the news bulletins um, and achieved the kind of level of exposure that was probably 10 times or 20 times what was spent on it. Mrs Thatcher's victory in 1979 was when all her work in opposition finally paid off. Surprisingly, this man, Michael Foote, was elected leader of the opposition. The news from Mrs. Thatcher. What do you say to that? Who could be such a fool as to say such a thing as that? How the Labour Party came to elect Michael Foote as leader uh, is an absolute mystery. Michael Foote was even then quite old, but he certainly looked a lot older than he was. His white flowing hair, his stick, he used to go walking on Hampstead Heath with his dog. The photographers loved it because he looked like a geriatric. He was a complete disaster. I think that there were kamikaze pilots, Labour MPs, who deliberately voted for Michael Foote in order to destroy the Labour Party. Then they went off and joined the SDP. Undeterred, Foote launched Labour's next election manifesto. It was full of left-wing tripe, quite honestly, and uh, one senior Labour MP, Gerald Kaufman, described it as the longest suicide note in history. The Labour Party underfoot, as it had indeed been almost throughout the post-war period, deeply suspicious of marketing, deeply suspicious of advertising men, deeply suspicious of public relations people, very uncomfortable. It was like supping with the devil. They brought their very long spoons when they met with people. And as if to prove his detachment from reality, Michael Foote committed the ultimate public relations gaffe. I got a call from a Labour MP um, called um, Walter Johnson, a Labour MP who'd been watching this in a pub in Haywards Heath with a lot of Colonel Blimps and said it's an absolute disgrace to leave the opposition wearing a donkey jacket at the Cenotaph November the 11th looking more like an out of work navvy. This is an absolute disgrace and this was his own leader. He told me later that that did more damage to him and Labour than anything else in unilateralism, the trade unions, whatever. And I'm almost certain he's right. Michael Foote's successor as opposition leader was Neil Kinnock. Elected to the waiting room of power, did he have what the job required? Kinnock, I think, is the great underrated leader of the opposition of the 20th century. He served nine grueling, really grim years. And I think, insofar as the job could be done, he did it pretty well. And like all Labour leaders, Kinnock had to confront the extremists in his own party to convince the public that Labour was electable. He wasn't a great Commons performer. Um, he was a marvellous platform performer, absolutely wonderful. I mean, that speech he made in 1985 uh, against Militant at the party conference. You start with far-fetched resolutions. They are then pickled into a rigid dogma, a code. And you go through the years sticking to that, outdated, misplaced, irrelevant to the real needs, and you end in the grotesque chaos of a Labour Council, a Labour Council hiring taxis to scuttle around the city, handing out redundancy notices to its own workers. David Owen said to me at that moment, he said, I knew the SDP was finished because this was exactly what the move that Kinnock ought to be making against the left, and he made it. It was very clear to me that we would never be taken seriously or indeed safeguard the integrity of the Labour Party if we allowed these parasites from the ultra-left to keep on flourishing. So they had to be dealt with. 
There's one, actually one better speech to be made. It'll be the first one that I make to address the Labour Party conference as Labour Prime Minister. Yeah. Neil Kinnock had one big difficulty as leader of the Labour Party, which was that he was trying to change it in every direction. He wanted to pull out of the European Union, he wanted to ban the bomb, and uh, on almost every single one of them, he performed a public and rather embarrassing somersault. So his credibility was damaged from the outset. You can say for Neil Kinnock that he sacrificed his personal reputation for the political good of the party. These things needed to be done, but the price of doing them was that he lost credibility for his own personality. I remember just before the 1987 general election, Kinnock said to me, only another 36 hours of Thatcherism. Of course, that was completely wrong. They suffered a huge defeat, and Thatcher was, um, was sailing on. The most basic raw ambition was not to come third, which seems like a very, very modest aspiration in the circumstances, but that was the reality that we confronted. I don't say this as a personal insult. People don't trust Neil Kinnock. I mean, they just don't trust him. Uh, and that was clear throughout the whole camp. It was clear in all our research, clear in all our work. We knew he couldn't win because the people didn't trust him. And so it proved in 1987. The Thatcher era continued into its third term. Neil Kinnock remained leader of his party, yet he still had an image problem, despite the best efforts to change it. He guy's mad at me. He uh, took part in a video with Tracy Ullman, trying to look, make himself look young and trendy. But the young people took one look at this and just regarded him as a plonker. Neil Kinnock was just one of the boys, or one of the boyos, and uh, he never overcame his previous life, which was to be in the press gallery bar drinking and singing until midnight or doing something like that around the country with members of the Labour Party. He was never taken fully seriously and one of his biggest problems was his tendency to waffle. He was notoriously known as the Welsh windbag. Being the Welsh windbag had something to it partly because um, I do use colourful speech and uh, there are elements in politics and the press who don't like that, well they've got to lump it. But the second reason is there were whole periods during which I couldn't disclose my strategic efforts and objective in changing policy. So there were often times when I was asked questions in interviews, for instance, when I had to flannel because I couldn't give a straight yes or no answer since it would have given the alarm to those people whose objections I had to overcome, particularly in the Labour Party. When Margaret Thatcher was forced to resign as Prime Minister, the Labour opposition would be facing a new and relatively untried opponent. It's an enormous encouragement to know that so many people in the Parliamentary Party are prepared to entrust me with the leadership of the Conservative Party and I will endeavour to discharge those responsibilities to the best of my ability. John Major was arguably less of a challenge than Thatcher and Kinnock entered the 1992 election with confidence. Probably too much, as he revealed at the huge televised American-style rally. Here, inside the Sheffield Arena, Neil and Glenis Kinnock. I remember it vividly. Uh, I was watching it on television and suddenly Neil Kinnock burst onto the stage like a vaudeville comic shouting, well all right, uh, well all right. Well all right! Well all right! Well all right! You could see behind him um, old hands like Gerald Kaufman and Roy Hattersley clutching their fevered brows. They could see that this ludicrous performance was causing thousands and thousands of Labour votes to go down the drain. I thought at the time, this is terrible. And the audience went wild. But I think everybody else watching the television in their lounges felt a chill going through them. And I think if there was ever a turning point in Neil Kinnock's chances of winning the 92 election, that was it. The rally 
had no significance whatsoever, positively or negatively. The profound reasons lay in the fact that we hadn't made the big changes with sufficient speed to give us enough time to ensure that the general public understood that the fundamental reforms that we undertaken were profound, rooted, lasting, and they hadn't been produced as expedients just to try and impress the public before the general election. We also had very serious doubts about whether the Labour Party itself had really changed enough, whether it had turned its back on the, on the bad old days, as many people saw it, of union domination and left-wing policies and so on, and they honestly didn't believe that Neil Kinnock and his party had changed enough. Ten days later, Kinnock lost his second general election and stood down, having laid some of the groundwork for his party's future. After years in the political wilderness and internal strife, Labour were desperate for power. That desperation and John Smith's untimely death in 1994 paved the way for Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, two frustrated young modernisers waiting in the wings. It was Tony Blair who was elected leader of the Labour Party in May 1994. Yet again, a new leader felt compelled to modernise his party and even rename it. We talked about new Labour as a concept. And then before the 1994 conference, there's always this period just before the conference where people go, we haven't got a backdrop for the conference. What's the backdrop going to be? And myself, Philip Gould, Peter Mandelson, we'd been sort of knocking a few ideas around. And I felt that the, the strongest of all the ideas that was kicking around was just say it, bold, new Labour. New Labour, New Britain. It had a message that went beyond the party, it was going to the public. And in the end it's about getting a message to the public. Blair managed to persuade the Labour Party to scrap Clause 4. This was something that a number of his predecessors had tried and failed to do. From the word go, Blair imposed his will upon his colleagues. I remember that morning, Tony had just been seeing some of the shadow cabinet to sort of take them into the, into the loop, as it were. And I can remember Robin Cook, for example, saying, well, Tony, I just have to warn you, I think this could lead to the Labour Party being completely torn apart. And she said, well, why? Why should it? Why do you say that? I mean, what's wrong with saying what we believe in? This is a modern party living in an age of change. It requires a modern constitution that says what we are in terms the public cannot misunderstand and the Tories cannot misrepresent. I honestly think that was a pillow fight. I think it was a pure symbolic gesture. It was not difficult in 1994, good save us, to abolish something that Hugh Gates could have wanted to get rid of in 1959 or 1960. The reason that huge bust-up was so valuable to Tony Blair was that it, it demonstrated to the public uh, out there that he was taking on his party, that he was willing to challenge his party and say to them, you do it my way or we're not going to win the next election. He deliberately picked a fight with his own party uh, and by doing so showed that the party had changed. I think it was one of the best conference speeches he did. He said, you know, they were, they were all on their feet applauding and all around the hall you could hear the sound of pennies dropping. In other words, he made Labour electable after nearly two decades of losing to the Conservatives. Blair focused on winning over Middle England. In the past, the dividing lines between Labour and the Conservatives had largely been set by the Conservatives. The Conservatives says, this is what we stand for, that's what Labour stands for, and there's the dividing line. What Tony Blair was determined to do was to shift those dividing lines to a completely different place where they were being defined by what Labour stood for and not by what the Tories stood for, pushing the Tories into a corner. Uh, and it worked very effectively. Sometimes we'd have a message, say, power, wealth and opportunity in the hands of the many, not the few, for example. And that was part of the new constitution, that phrase. And tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime governing from the radical centre. All these sort of phrases that they come in and they come out of the political debate. Sweep away the dog. But the crunch would be the election of 1997, in which Labour was the odds-on favourite to win. In opposition, Blair had painstakingly prepared for this contest.
think that what happened in the period running up to New Labour's victory in 1997 and through the John Major years, there was a huge amount of very clever and carefully manipulated propaganda. What he did so cleverly, in my opinion, was to conduct what was a grand larceny, really, of Tory language. Um, uh, and also, he you know, brought in what a, amount to Tory policies. And, and, of course, this was very, very difficult um, for the Conservatives in government um, to oppose. And even to this day, the Conservatives in opposition are finding some of the policies um, they like and they can't oppose them, uh, which is quite embarrassing for them. We've always meant for all party talks and all party participation. Tony Blair's political friends were of the centre, not the left. Centrists like Bill Clinton taught Blair how to woo the swing voters, the people who decide the outcomes of elections. People saw the 97 election under Tony Blair, people in the Labour Party, saw that as the last chance. If the party had lost in 97, quite rightly, I think, it would have been written off as a, as a political force. It would never have come back. And so an awful lot of people were prepared to swallow their doubts about some of the policy changes, were prepared to go along with things that Tony Blair wanted to do, which they felt was moving too fast or, or moving too far to the right, perhaps. And Tony Blair was given a hell of a lot of leeway. Blair had shown he was in control of his party and was now ready to face the voters. It was time to see whether the hard work in opposition would finally pay off. All the people that have worked so hard. Everything just sort of did come together. Another ex-leader of the opposition. So who would be the next one? After 18 years in power, the Tories were unused to opposition. They were plunged into a leadership contest that boiled down to a choice between pro-European Kenneth Clark and the youthful William Hague. The result of the third ballot for the leader of the Conservative Party is as follows. Kenneth Clark, 70. William Hague, 92. I therefore declare that William Hague... What matters the most members of Parliament was not what maximised their chances of being elected, which probably would have been the blokish, smiling, relaxed Ken Clark, but rather taking a punt on a complete unknown and a very inexperienced person, William Haig, um, because the most important thing to the Tory members was that he was not pro-European, in fact, that he was anti-European. I think history will say that the Conservative Party brought about its own downfall uh, through being just simply stubborn and saying we'll elect who we like, we don't care what the electorate believes about that at all. I like to move it, move it. William Hague's attempt to look youthful backfired. A lesson, perhaps, for David Cameron? William Hague was talked into doing a lot of stupid things which he probably wouldn't have done on his own, going around with a baseball cap with Hague on the front. And various other things that he did which really, quite frankly, made him look a chump and people see through all this. Sam Smith's Yorkshire. Right. Well, a lot of the things that he did or boasted about really came back to hit him in the face. He used to say that he drank 14 pints a day when he worked as a drayman's assistant and that he once drank more than 32 rums at a session. Well, that would kill most people. And in fact, one of the publicans in the area in South Yorkshire where he's supposed to have drunk 14 pints a day said, oh, that's all a load of lies. We used to call him Fizzy Willie because he used to get drunk on half a pint. Just like it should be. I know he's very keen on summing up policy in six words. Well, how about this? You are the weakest link, goodbye. <laughs> it was better than the Palladium on a Saturday night when Haig and Blair were at it. Judging by the content, Mr Speaker, of the Queen's speech, this is probably to be the last Queen's speech uh, of this Parliament. In fact, there was so little in it that I think it was very good of Her Majesty to come down here to deliver it at all. <laughs> the funniest and most incisive opposition leaders I've seen in, in more than 40 years there. He was absolutely brilliant, more often 
the knot he had Blair reeling on his heels. But when it came down to what really mattered, he was a complete failure. Haig turned on the road to modernization. You know, he began by being a sort of moderniser. And then he hit the panic button. The advisers said, look, you're losing the traditional Tory supporters. Um, if you get back onto being against uh, immigration, against Europe, in favour of lower taxes, at the very least, the Daily Mail will support you. And he couldn't see anybody else who was supporting him. And so that's the way he went. And uh, a very reactionary programme it was. And it was annihilated by the electorate. When we got William Hague fighting, I think, the uh, 2001 election, 10 days to save the pound, this kind of thing. Well, it looks ludicrous even now looking back. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, they were just caught up and obsessed by this extraordinary kind of uh, uh, enmity that they had developed towards the European uh, Union. After losing in 2001, Hague stepped down as opposition leader. We have not been able to persuade a majority or anything approaching a majority in the country that we are yet the alternative government that they need. Nor have I been able to persuade sufficient numbers that I am their alternative Prime Minister. Cameron can learn from Haig lots of negatives, lots of things not to do. Don't talk about immigration, don't talk about tax cuts, don't talk about Europe because those are what the people expect Tories to talk about. Talk about subjects they don't expect, like the environment, and talk about it in a way that they don't expect Tories to speak. After Hay, who would lead the Tories? Out of a crowded field of candidates, party members chose a dark horse. Ian Duncan Smith's appeal seemed to lie in his anti-European stance and not being Kenneth Clark. I think pretty well the entire nation was amazed um, that uh, Ian Duncan Smith won the uh, leadership election. He was not the man for the job. That became plain um, right from the start. Ian Duncan Smith was the proof of a party in total doctrinal extremis. And only a party that had sort of uh, lost all touch with reality could conceivably have elected Ian Duncan Smith, never been a minister, against a man who had been Chancellor and Home Secretary and Education Secretary, was still at those days in the full flush of vigour. Ken Clark, popular with the public, sort of hush puppies and all. And if they couldn't see that, then they didn't deserve to be elected. He lacked the charisma, he lacked the personality, be, uh, personality to be leader. And he struggled to see how he could introduce his ideas of social change against a background of depending for support on the most reactionary elements in the party. For Duncan Smith, doubts about his fitness for the job set in early. He even made a sort of public apology for his failure to make much impact. Do not underestimate the determination of a quiet man. The thing that was peculiar throughout the entire speech was the way that every two or three seconds there would be a, a standing ovation. And looking at it from outside, you saw the whole audience sitting on its hands, and suddenly a little square surrounding uh, the speaker, Ian Duncan Smith, erupting and standing up uh, and applauding. And they did it uh, as if orchestrated, and of course they were being orchestrated. Labour MPs couldn't wait to poke fun at the quiet man by shushing him. Ian Duncan Smith. Yeah. The following year, um, he, he, he um, sort of boosted that by saying um, the quiet man is turning up the volume, which, which wasn't really very clever. The quiet man is here to stay and he's turning up the volume. He never really galvanised the party. He never got enough people behind him. He didn't have the support inside the higher reaches of the party that he needed to stamp his authority on what was still a bedraggled, defeated, demoralised party. And basically, he simply never got off the ground. Actually, what would be really nice is if you paused and waved here, because actually it shows you're very relaxed. And if you then went to the other side... Michael Howard became opposition leader when Duncan Smith was forced out. As a fellow barrister, he was a match for Tony Blair in the Commons. First of all, I should welcome the Right Honourable Gentleman to his new position. And 
And to say how delighted I am that someone written off under the last Conservative government is now given the chance to rehabilitate himself under Labour. Let me, let me make it absolutely clear. I'm very happy to debate the past with the Prime Minister any day he likes. Any day he likes. I've, I've got a great big dossier on his past. I've got a great big dossier on his past and I haven't even had to sex it up. We were in considerable difficulties um, at the time that I took over. Um, we were perceived as a um, very divided party. And um, a lot of the commentators were predicting that uh, if things carried on as they are, we might end up in third place at uh, the subsequent general election. So the first priority was to restore a sense of discipline and unity and then to change the way in which the party was perceived and to show that we were a credible uh, and convincing alternative to Labour. The 2005 election campaign became dominated by Howard's tough stance on immigration. Like Haig's saving the pound, repetition started to bore the voters. Immigration was one of our five um, key um, messages. Um, it did attract a disproportionate amount of attention and not from me, I think we devoted one press conference to our policy on immigration, but obviously in a lot of the interviews I did, um, immigration tended to dominate the coverage. If you're thinking what we're thinking about clean hospitals, you have the opportunity to send a message tomorrow. Vote Conservative tomorrow. Are you thinking what we're thinking was, of course, one of the greatest mistakes ever made? Because the answer is no. Um, and I'm afraid that was the case. I see Michael Howard as a tragic figure uh, in that when he gave up the leadership, he recognised, I think, that he should have been a moderniser. And he opened the way for Cameron as a moderniser. And yet when he was actually there as leader, he didn't do it. He didn't lead the party in that direction. They certainly learnt nothing from history, um, and uh, I'm sure that looking back, there must be the more thoughtful Conservatives who have said to themselves, why on earth, here we are in the seventh, eighth year of opposition, why can't we do the same that the Conservative Party did between 45 and 51? Perhaps the rejuvenation has begun. Who's going to win the World Cup? England! Only, it's only our first exchange, and already the Prime Minister is asking me the questions. <laughs> this approach is stuck in the past, and I want to talk about the future. Yeah. He was the future once. <laughs> he's, um, I mean, the thing is, he's, he's obviously trying to do a Blair but without the kind of messianic cruelty that Blair has as an essential part of his character. And, uh, you know, just wants to be loved, wants to be seen as everybody's mate, riding a bicycle, having children, wearing a hoodie, and, uh, you know, just go, hey, yeah, I'll, I'll be your friend. If you look at David Cameron's strategy since he became uh, leader of the Conservative Party, it's blindingly obvious that both he and the people closest to him have been studying Tony Blair's war book. They've been looking at what Blair did as leader when he became leader of, of the Labour Party, turning it into New Labour and all the rest of it. And, and they have been doing their best to replicate almost everything that he did, both in terms of the mood music, of repositioning the party to the centre ground, of reaching out to, to Liberal Democrat voters, of attempting to do these very sort of dramatic uh, speeches or interviews or whatever it might be to send out a strong signal to the public that the party has changed. Cameron's doing all of that. The problem I think he's got is that people have seen it all before. I really don't think it's going to work because actually we, now we're all completely sick to death of Tony Blair and we're completely sick to death of spin and PR. And so what do the Tories do rather than getting a red-faced master of foxhounds or country squire to come and tell us all to sit still and behave ourselves, we get a PR man. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, we're fed up of Tony Blair. I, I know, hey, let's get Tony Blair. It's bonkers, absolutely bonkers. He's made the right strategic decision in saying that the Conservative Party has to move from the right to the centre. Saying it is dead easy. You've then got to drive it through with policy. For now, Cameron isn't spelling out detailed policy. 
but in more subtle ways, he set out to change voters' perceptions of the Conservatives. Like every leader of the opposition, he needs to reconquer the middle ground. Being on the middle ground, in my view, is not something the Conservatives should be frightened about. It's a position that they should relish and they should welcome. And they shouldn't be distracted by the anomaly of Mrs Thatcher's period in office. Mrs Thatcher brilliantly capitalised on a period in which the Labour Party moved to the left and that gave her the opportunity to move to the right. But that was very, very atypical. And where the Conservative Party has failed since is not to recognise quickly enough that when the Labour Party moves back to the centre, you must scramble back to the centre as well. But what happens if you overdo it and leave behind your core supporters? One of Cameron's first real tests came recently in the Bromley by-election. The safe seat had been held by a traditionalist right-winger, but the Tories very nearly lost it. The result is a warning to Cameron. The Conservative Party has not moved one inch. David Cameron has convinced the public that he is different to their normal expectation of a Tory leader. Brilliantly done. Well done. He has convinced um, the public that he thinks the Conservative Party should be different. He has not changed the Conservative Party. So is Cameron, with his environmental concerns, out of tune with his own party? He has yet to tell us what he plans for tax, crime and immigration. The Tories may not be very different, but the style of their leadership most definitely is. No leader changes the entire party. Blair certainly didn't. Much of the Labour Party remains, remains unreformed. I think you only need a fairly small team. Margaret Thatcher had at most half a dozen like-minded people. Uh, Blair, Brown, Mandelson, who else? It was quite a small team. And Cameron's the same. Provided you've got three or four people around you who walk the walk and talk the talk, you can give the impression that the party has changed. And that's what Cameron will need to do. Will he be another Gateskill or Michael Howard? an opposition leader who never made it, or another Wilson, Thatcher, or Blair. I think he's made a brave dab at trying to get people to believe that the Conservative Party is not the Conservative Party of Margaret Thatcher or anything like that anymore. The trouble with doing that is that you do risk uh, alienating some of your core vote. And I think there will be rumbles on the right before David Cameron ever gets in, if he does, to number 10. Cameron could be Prime Minister in two jumps, not one. In my view, he cannot win the next general election simply because the Tories are too far behind. But he'll do well enough to be kept as Tory leader and well enough to win the time after.